Hi everyone, I'm so excited you're able to join us today for our live Wetland Wednesdays broadcast about adaptations in wetland animals. My name is Katherine Fox and I'm the Extension Associate for the Youth Wetlands Program. Uh, before I started talking, there was a screen up asking what is an animal adaptation? If you could please take your time to post your response in the comments, we would really appreciate that. So if you're just now joining us, thanks for being here. Uh, the Louisiana 4-H Wetland Ambassadors are going to be joining us a little later on to talk about the adaptations of a few different wetland animals. So if you're having a little bit of trouble thinking about what an adaptation is, uh, think about how different, how animals have different behaviors and characteristics um, and how those behaviors and characteristics help them. All right, really excited to see everyone joining us. So uh, if you're just now joining, please answer this question by typing a response into the comments. That'd be great. I'll give you a hint. It does have to deal with both their physical features and their behavior. All right, so I see some comments starting to come in. Recreating what animals look like. Yeah, a little bit, that's on the right track. All right, so just so we can go ahead and keep this rolling, I'll go ahead and provide the definition for an adaptation. So an animal adaptation is a physical feature or behavior that helps an animal survive and live in its environment. So this could be a characteristic that helps it find food, uh, find shelter, find mates, defend itself against predators, and help it stay safe from other dangers that might be in its environment. So the adaptation for each animal is specific to their environments that they live in. So with that, can you guys think of animals that you would find living in a desert environment? Um, if you're having trouble about thinking about what kind of animals you'd find in a desert environment, think about the animal adaptations that would help an animal to survive in a desert. Um, and if you're still having a little bit of trouble, you can think about animals that definitely couldn't survive in the desert because they have the wrong adaptations, like a polar bear. So polar bears couldn't survive in a desert environment because they're, they are adapted for the Arctic where it's snowy, icy, cold, and they have access to water. Uh, if you're just now joining us, thank you so much for joining. We're going to be talking about adaptations in wetland animals. And in a few minutes, the, some of the Louisiana 4-H wetland ambassadors will be joining us to talk about those adaptations. And spiders, yep, you find spiders in the desert. Um, and while we're waiting for some more responses to come in, if you are looking for activities to do at home, you can check out Wetland Wednesdays. We post activities every week uh, with, that you can use household items to do at home. Snakes, yep, rattlesnakes for sure. Thanks Claire and Brian for your responses. All right, so yes, rattlesnakes, spiders, uh, you'll find some birds and some lizards living in deserts as well as many other animals. So you'd actually be surprised about the number of animals that you can find adapted to living in a desert environment. But we're here to talk about wetlands, so we're gonna shift into that. So wetland animals have to be adapted to living in both dry and wet conditions because both can happen in the wetlands. They also have to be adapted to the wide variety of predators you can find there and to the dangers that can happen in the wetlands. An example of something dangerous that isn't a predator would be flooding. Flooding can happen all the times in wetlands and the animals have to be adapted to uh, respond to that appropriately. Today, we're gonna to be talking about the American beaver, the American alligator, and the whooping crane. And our wetland ambassadors are gonna help with each of those animals. So let's get started. And I'm gonna bring wetland ambassador Cole Martin up to talk about the beaver. Thank you, Ms. Catherine. So like she said, uh, my name is Cole Martin and I am a graduating senior from, from Lafourche Parish. And I'm here to talk to you guys today about the beaver. So before we get started, I have a quick question for everyone. And that is, 
what are some adaptations that the beaver has? So we just went over what an adaptation is for an animal. So what do you think are some adaptations that, that the beaver has to better suit its environment? And while we're, we're waiting on the responses to come in, I'm gonna go over some basic facts about the beaver, such as the beaver is the largest living rodent in North America. The adult beaver weighs in at around 33 pounds and, and can measure from three to four feet in length. Um, the average lifespan of a beaver is around 19 years. And their the scientific name is Castor conadensis. Sorry. So, waiting on some responses to come in. What are some adaptations that a beaver might have? Um, I see someone said big sharp teeth for sure. Um, beavers are definitely famous for those big teeth that they have, and they use that to to be able to eat, uh, chew on woods in order to build their dams. So that's for sure one. Let's see if we can get one more pretty soon here. Well, the two adaptations that I'm going to talk to you guys about today are the beaver's fur, and a special ear muscle that it has in its ear. So uh, first, we're, we're going to go over the furs. I'm going to demonstrate that by having this brown towel right here. Now, the, the beaver's fur is kind of cool. Uh, they use this fur to shed off water uh, to not weigh it down so much, and the, the fur keeps the animal very warm. It's a thick layer of fur, so that keeps it warm in the colder environments and uh, going um, underwater. Now, the fur also acts as a camouflage. Beavers live on the banks of rivers and streams, and they allow, they're around a lot of wood, so they have to be camouflaged from other, pred from other predators. Now, the next thing I'm going to talk to you guys about is a special ear muscle that they have, which is represented by these headphones right here. I'm sorry. Um, now, what this ear muscle does is that whenever the beaver dives underneath the water, this, this muscle actually close off the ear canal. So this is very helpful to the beaver. Uh, it one stops water from going in and hurting its ears, and it allows the beaver to stay underneath water for a longer period of time. Now I'm gonna talk to you guys about one more thing, which I'm gonna put these gloves on for, and that is the the beaver's front paws. Now a beaver will use his front paws much like me or you would uh, to grab things. So uh, in a beaver's case, it will use its front paws to grab wood, to build dams, to climb trees, and and things such as that. So. Um, that, that about wraps it up for what I'm here to talk to you guys about. So I'm going to pass it over to a fellow wetland ambassador, Gabby, to talk to you guys a little more about the beaver. Thank you. Hi, my name is Gabrielle Freeview, and I'm a 4-H wetlands ambassador from Wynn Parish. I will also be discussing the beaver. Before I go through some of the adaptations, I'm going to state some facts about the beaver. Beavers live in lodges that they build on the banks of rivers and streams from mud and small trees. They are great swimmers and can hold their breath underwater for approximately 12 to 15 minutes. They have special features that help them live in an aquatic habitat. The first adaptation I'm going to talk about is the beaver's teeth, which I will represent with these craft sticks. The beavers use their teeth to obtain wood materials from trees to build their lodges and for food. The beaver's front teeth grow continuously. So why do y'all think that the beaver's teeth have to grow continuously? They grow up to three inches a month. During their lifetime, beavers are strict vegetarians, eating on plants, grasses, and vegetation, but they get most of their nutrition from eating on the outer layer of trees. The teeth also stick out past the beaver's lips so they can gnaw chew and swallow underwater without choking. So the beaver's teeth grow continuously because they wear down from the wood that the beavers gnaw. The next adaptation I'm going to talk about is the beaver's tail. I will represent it with this piece of cardboard. The beavers have a wide flat tail measuring 11 to 15 inches long and six inches wide. The tail helps the beaver swim while it's in the water. When slapped against the water, the tail can be used as a mechanism uh, to warn other beavers of possible danger. It is also a place to store fat that, uh, when, that can be used when the food supply is low. And it is also used as a support for the beavers to sit on while they gnaw on trees.
I will now turn it over to Nathan, who will tell you about one of Louisiana's most famous animals, the alligator. Okay. Hey, y'all. I'm Nathan Thompson. I'm a wetlands ambassador from Lafayette Parish, and I'll be showing y'all some of the alligator's adaptations. So the American alligator is the largest North American reptile, and they're found mostly in the southeastern United States. If anyone knows what the top two states with the most alligators in them are, then please leave that in the comments, and I'll get to that in a minute. So while I'm waiting for y'all's responses, I'll go over some more facts. Uh, the alligator's biological name is Alligator Mississippiensis. The name alligator comes from early Spanish explorers who called them big lizards when they first saw them. Alligators live mostly in freshwater habitats like rivers, lakes, swamps, and marshes, and they are well adapted for swimming. Male alligators can be 10 to 15 feet on average and weigh over 500 pounds, while females average 9 feet and around 200 pounds. And their average lifespan is about the same as a human at 70 years. So. Um, I'm still waiting for comments to come in, um, but uh, if anyone said Louisiana or Florida, that would be the correct answer, so good job to anyone who said that, and I'm going to go on to the adaptations. The first adaptation I'm going to talk about is the skin, which is represented by the green poncho I'm wearing. The alligator skin has adapted to fit its environment in a couple of different ways. The first way would be the green coloration, which helps give the alligator camouflage to its environment. This is for protection from threats like other alligators. Um, and also, you know, just so it can hide from anything it needs to be protected from. The second adaptation I'm going to talk about is represented by these goggles, and that would be the nictitating membrane. The, the nictitating membrane is like a second clear eyelid that the alligator can close while it goes underwater. And it works basically like the goggles. It works so they can still see while keeping water and debris out of their eyes. And the last adaptation is their teeth, represented by these tongs. The alligators have special cone-shaped teeth, and when combined with their powerful jaw, makes it incredibly hard to escape an alligator's bite. Um, this helps the alligator as they will grasp and hold their prey with their teeth. Okay, that's all the adaptations I have for today, so I'm going to pass it over to our next ambassador, Bridget. Hi guys, my name is Bridget Seegers, and I'm a wetland ambassador from St. Tammy Parish. Today, I'm really excited to show you the adaptations of the whooping crane. So, first off, do you know what the whooping crane is? It's one of the rarest birds in the world. The whooping crayon is the tallest bird in North America, standing at five feet tall, and it has a wingspan of over seven feet. Unfortunately, in the 1800s, overhunting and habitat loss caused its populations to decline. These cranes use wetlands with shallow water to hunt, nest, and roost. And today I'm gonna go over some adaptations that help them live in these wetland environments. So juvenile whooping cranes are brown, which helps them blend into their marsh environment. Whooping cranes begin flying when they are 80 days old and they have white feathers. I am representing white feathers with the white towel that I'm wearing, which helps camouflage them when they are flying in the sky. Next up, I'm putting on a pair of shades. Can you guess why I'm putting on a pair of shades? Whooping cranes have a built-in bone in their heads, which protect their eyelids from too much sun. And lastly, I'm using a pair of tongs to represent the whooping crane's beak. Whooping cranes have special sensors in their beaks, and as well as the shape of their beak, which help them to pluck prey from the mud. Can you guess some of the things that whooping cranes eat? Whooping cranes are omnivores, which means they eat both plants and animals. So use your imagination and think, what might a whooping crane decide to snack on? While we're waiting on some responses, I'm gonna share a few facts with you. Did you know that all of the whooping cranes today have been descended from 15 whooping cranes? In 2011, a reintroduction process 
started in Louisiana from the 15 birds that were left. These 15 birds were put into captivity and bred. And in 2011, as I said, they began to be reintroduced. Our Louisiana flock is still growing and being tracked every day. And you can keep up with them with Louisiana Department of Wildlife and Fisheries. So if you said anything from berries to crawfish to fish, minnows, small mammals, you'd be right. Those are some things that whooping cranes like to snack on. And these are three adaptations of the whooping crane. So I'm gonna throw it back to our Youth Wetlands Program leader, Ms. Catherine, to close us out. All right, big thanks to the Wetland Ambassadors for doing a great job of exploring those different adaptations of the American beaver, the American alligator, and the whooping crane. Now that we've all learned a little bit more about the wetland animal adaptations, you can create your own wetland animal by visiting our Youth Wetlands webpage and clicking on the Wetland Wednesday button to access the wetland animal adaptations activity. You can also use the link in the caption for this video to access the activity as well. So you get to create your own wetland animal, uh, design it, name it, and come up with five adaptations that help that animal survive in the wetlands. Uh, if you decide to do the activity and you want to share your creation with us, please post a picture in the comments. We'd love to see it. Uh, and there are also more wetland activities that you can do at home available at the Wetland Wednesdays page. All right. Thanks again for joining us. If you have any questions that we didn't answer in the video, please feel free, feel free to add them in the comments and we'll answer them after this video is ended. Thanks, everyone. Hope you have a great rest of your day.